Welcome, everybody. This is the 11th, I believe, a Nation webinar. We used to do these things over breakfast um, before breakfast involved like risking your life. Um, so we've moved it online um, and we thank you so much um, for coming. Your support um, and your commitment to independent journalism in these times just couldn't be uh, more important um, and more valuable um, to us. So we really appreciate you, uh, you coming out today. Um, for our guest, um, we are joined today um, by one of the most kind of impressive women um, out there in the game right now. Um, Alicia Garza. Um, it is my presence, it's my pleasure to introduce Alicia Garza. Um, Alicia Garza is an Oakland based organizer, writer, public speaker, and a freedom dreamer who is currently the special projects director for the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the nation's leading voice for dignity and fairness for the millions of domestic workers in the United States. Garza, along with um, Opal, um, Opal uh, Tometi and Patrice Cullors, also founded the Black Lives Matter Network kind of important just at the moment. Um, since, the B since the rise of the BLM movement, Garza has been a powerful advocate for racial justice in the media. Her articles and interviews have been featured in Time, uh, Mike, The Guardian, Elle, Essence, Democracy Now!, and The New York Times. Uh, and that was like before the whole The New York Times like got a clue, so that's impressive. Um, <laughs> We are proud um, that Garza has published articles in The Nation as well. We hope she writes many more. Um, a dynamic and highly sought after speaker, Garza has received numerous uh, recognitions, including the 2016 Glamour Woman of the Year Award um, and inclusion on the Roots uh, 2016 uh, list of 100 African-American achievers and influencers. Most importantly, as a queer black woman, uh, Garza's leadership and work challenged the misconception that only cisgender black men, that would be me, um, encounter uh, police and state violence, and that could not be more true. Uh, uh, a lot of times when we talk about police brutality, um, we focus on, um, on black males. And you know, we got some problems. Um, but this is, this is an equal opportunity brutality regime. <laughs> Um, uh, um, and, and, and it's, it's so important to focus, um, also to center the conversation also on women of color, um, who are targeted and, you know, trans people, uh, uh of color who are, you know, uh, or, who are in danger almost every time they step out of their house. Um, with the tragic deaths of Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown um, were catalysts for the emergence of BLM, um, George and George Floyd's murder set the spark for the current um, unrest and rebellion, Garza is clear, in order to truly understand how devastating and widespread this type of violence is in Black America, we must uh, view this uh, epidemic through the lens of race, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Um, so with that, I want to turn the floor over to Alicia Garza. Um, she's going to speak for about 15 minutes, and then I have a couple of questions that I want to ask her, and then we will open it up to the floor um, for your questions. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. And Ms. Garza, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I really appreciate this. And thank you for your very, very kind words. And thank you to the nation um, for having me this morning. Um, I will be drinking my coffee because <laughs> it is early still on the West Coast, so you'll forgive me if I need to pause to caffeinate. <laughs> so I wanted to just start off by talking a little bit about this moment and putting this moment in context. I mean, clearly we are seeing unprecedented uprisings, not only across the nation, but across the world. And while this is very much centered in and centered on the ongoing um, extrajudicial murders of Black people, um, this moment is also very much finding us at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads um, where we are facing and, and trying to navigate uh, what it means to be in the midst of a global pandemic and certainly um, in this country, a public health crisis that is very, very severe. Uh, we are in the midst of um, an increasing economic crisis. Uh, and as I understand it, we are actually officially now in a recession. Um, we are in the midst of a democracy that is in crisis. 
uh, just, you know, a month or so ago, we were talking about, you know, presidential primary uh, in that process, uh, which is making my stomach hurt, um, is now thoroughly confused, right? <laughs> um, we know that there will likely be conventions in August, but we don't actually know what the process will be moving forward. And that is something that is also unprecedented. And then all of this is layered over, and I would say even if we're going to use metaphors, uh, soaked through, right, um, with the ongoing burden and crisis of white supremacy and white nationalism. And so when we think about what it is that people are out in the streets about, it is very much about watching a man's life be extinguished before our eyes uh, on camera, right, where he was uh, his neck was kneeled on by a police officer sworn to protect and serve uh, for eight minutes and 45 seconds. Um, and we watched uh, not only George Floyd's life be extinguished, but certainly in the weeks prior, we saw the deaths of people like Breonna Taylor, um, an essential worker who was killed in her own home uh, during a no-knock raid. Uh, we saw the deaths of people like uh, Ahmad Arbery, who was literally just jogging on the street in Georgia um, and was accosted by uh, a family and their friends and ended up murdered. Um, and we've also seen, uh, you know, instances of murders of Black trans people, Tony McDade, um, who I believe was also an essential worker and was uh, ultimately killed by police in, in Tallahassee, Florida. And so, yes, it is about the ongoing violence of policing in this country, but it is also very much about a crisis, a series of crises that have been getting sharper and sharper, uh, certainly over the last few months, but I think it's fair to say that um, these are crises that many of us have been trying to wave the flag around for many, many years now. And given that, um, we are not only in the midst of an incredible moment around uprising and resistance, but we're also faced with the question of where do we go from here? Um, and we are faced with a question of if this series of systems is not working, right, then what are we replacing those systems with? And that to me is the fundamental question for this moment. And it certainly is the fundamental question that is facing this nation. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, across the world, people are also rising up in solidarity with folks here in the United States. But we also should not just see that as a, uh, a resistance to police violence and, and the ways in which policing is enacting violence throughout our communities. Uh, I think we should also understand this global connection very much as um, a resistance to the uh, the leadership or lack thereof in this country and the way that it impacts um, governments and countries across the world. Uh, we are not the only country, <laughs> surprise, surprise, we are not the only nation um, that is in the midst of a revolution. Um, certainly that revolution is not our revolution, right? <laughs> there is a kind of right wing movement that has been um, gaining steam and 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 gaining prominence and power around the world, particularly in places where we had previously seen um, incredible uh, uh, organizing and power building efforts literally coming from the left, right? So when we're looking at, you know, places like Brazil and we're seeing the right wing takeover of Brazil, these are very important kind of um, uh, uh, advancements in, in, in this global context. And I, I, I say that to just offer us um, a way to think about how revolution is not reserved for the left. Certainly, we are in the midst of a um, right-wing revolution, and that revolution is sweeping the country, and it's gaining prominence, and it's gaining power. And so I, I think that, you know, similarly to here, what people are resisting, right, is not just um, the symptoms of the crisis, but really resisting the crisis itself and pushing all of us to reimagine what is possible in this moment. I want to say that um, certainly in my lifetime, I don't think I ever believed um, that we would be having a national conversation about what it means 
to reimagine public safety. I don't think that I have ever, I know for a fact that in my lifetime, um, I have never heard calls for defunding police and defunding militarization in such a strong and mainstream way as I have in this moment. And so it begs the question of um, what do we offer this moment to help push those demands forward? And I, I wanna spend a little bit of time, you know, just talking about um, some of the challenges we're facing in terms of moving that agenda forward and why moving that agenda forward as it's been articulated is important. So I sit at, the, at a nexus of a very interesting set of positions. <laughs> I am one of the co-creators of the Black Lives Matter Global Network, uh, you know, which we started seven years ago after Trayvon Martin's killer was uh, acquitted in his murder. Um, and you know, when we started Black Lives Matter seven years ago, um, it was not a popular idea. <laughs> um, for those of us on the left, certainly, um, I think, you know, folks could get with it, as they say, but there were even a lot of struggles uh, in gaining alignment with Black Lives Matter on the left. Now, the things that we said and experienced on the right were things that we expected, but certainly kind of this, uh, this moment in 2013 of starting Black Lives Matter actually saw um, attacks from the left and attacks from the right. And I think we're seeing those dynamics again, and it's important to name them so that we can recognize them. And so as my mentors and elders say, you know, um, we actually have an opportunity to make new mistakes as opposed to continuing to make the same old mistakes over and over and expecting different results. Um, so let me say this uh, in relationship to attacks from the left and the right. You know, in 2013, when we started Black Lives Matter, um, we were told that, um, you, you know, I generally agree. Yes, yeah, sure, Black Lives should matter. But don't you think you should change the slogan so that people can be more comfortable with it? Shouldn't you instead say Black Lives Matter too? Or all lives matter? <laughs> or Black and Brown Lives Matter? Or People of Color Lives Matter? Right? <laughs> there were all of these different uh, uh, re-articulations that people pleaded, pleaded and pleaded with us to do. I'm really glad that we didn't do that. Uh, as Nene Leakes would say from The Real Housewives of Atlanta, which is one of my favorite shows, maybe one of my contradictions, I said what I said. <laughs> and, you know, Black people rising up to say that our lives matter doesn't need to be more palatable to anybody. And in fact, the, the the very notion that we would try to change it to make people more comfortable under the guise of getting more people to support it really defeats the purpose of the intervention itself. The fact of the matter is that black communities are at the losing end of almost every disparity that you can think of in this country from healthcare to housing, to the economy, um, to education, uh, black lives do not matter. So we can't say black lives matter too because still is a proposition that is false. <laughs> and we can continue to say things like all lives matter, but the contradiction there is that that is an aspiration, but it is not reflective of the reality that we live in. And I start with this because I think it's important for us to tie that to um, the current calls for defunding the police. And, you know, again, in the last couple of weeks, you know, I was telling Ellie, um, we've lived 30 years in the last three weeks. And part of where all of my new gray hairs come from um, <laughs> this month is the calls that I get from people who, A, believe that I have a red phone that I can pick up and tell people to turn up or turn down at any given moment. I do not have that phone. It does not exist, but somebody should build it. <laughs> but also, you know, the notion, the very notion that if we just talk about it differently, then we will actually get more people to support it. Um, and therefore, we will win a victory that's an easier road, right? And I want to be really clear that the road to victory in this moment is not easy, and it's not going to taste good. Um, it's not going to feel good. And the best kind of victories, in my opinion, are the ones that we fight hard for. And that includes fighting ourselves around the layers of 
things that we have been told and sold about the way things have to be um, that keep us from actually um, advancing the changes that we say that we want. Um, I don't want to get into message testing around uh, whether or not defund the police is popular. I think what we find from polls, uh, and you know, polls are relative and they are snapshots of any given moment in time, um, is that actually more people than four weeks ago <laughs> support the notion of defunding the police. And um, you know, and those numbers are somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, right, which is unprecedented. So I would beg the question of why would we stop that progress if we know that it's happening, knowing that um, the fundamental thing that we want people to do is grapple with the fact that, one, we are spending inordinate amounts of precious resources on a system that doesn't do what we say we want it to do. So that's just a fact. Um, people who want to be safe, people who want to live in safe and secure communities, we are spending an inordinate amount of money to um, advance public safety. And yet we are still watching black people being murdered on camera. And there are many, many more black people who are being murdered by these forces who never make the national news. In fact, they never make the local news. And that is also by design, and we're going to talk about that in a second as well. Um, but also, we have this tension where um, not only are we spending an inordinate amount of money on, on safety that's not keeping us safe, we are disinvesting or defunding, you could say, um, the things that do keep us safe and the things that do bring security and stability to our communities. We have been defunding healthcare for a very long time in this country. And if this pandemic can teach us anything, it's that um, our priorities have been wrong. <laughs> our priorities have been 100% wrong for many, many years. And now that we are in crisis, we all want to say, oh my gosh, what's happening? Why don't, why don't nurses and doctors have the PPE that they need? Well, it's because this revolution that has been sweeping the country has made it so that we are defunding the things that we need to live well and to live with dignity. Um, so the reason that people like my cousin who are, who's an ER nurse or an ER doctor, excuse me, she would correct me there and say, I'm not a nurse, I'm a doctor. <laughs> and a black doctor in Boston at that. <laughs> um, the fact that, you know, my cousin who is an ER doctor in Boston um, is serving this country every single day, showing up to make sure that people are comfortable, showing up to make sure that people are well, and that she's being given garbage bags as PPE. The fact that she is uh, trying to treat people who are literally saying to her, I don't want a black doctor, and still showing up to serve, um, should really put this question of why do we talk about defund the police <laughs> in that way, in a way that makes me feel uncomfortable? It should really put that in context, right? We have been defunding education in this country for years. And it is the fundamental reason that, you know, the young people that we keep saying need to be in school and off the streets, it's the fundamental reason that they're on the streets. Because young people in schools and communities like mine that have been defunded don't have books when they show up to class. When they show up to schools, they see police, but they don't have guidance counselors to help them think about what a career might look like and how they can access that career. That's just a fact. Um, we have been defunding housing in our communities for years, supportive housing, affordable housing, right? And so when we are talking about, you know, why are people on the streets? When we are talking about why are people on the streets in the midst of a global pandemic? And then um, using police forces to punish, right? People who don't actually have a place to go to or the place that they do have to go to is not safe. We can't keep saying that this message, actually, right, um, is too uncomfortable for us to grapple with. Frankly, it's important for us to be uncomfortable in this moment, and it's important for this country to face what it has done, not just to Black communities, but what it is doing to communities across the nation by a continuous agenda of defunding the things that keep us safe, the things that keep us secure, the things that allow us to live with the dignity that we deserve, 
and replacing it with punishment and surveillance and military grade weapons to um, deal with what happens when people don't have the things that they need to live well. It becomes a vicious cycle. In my community, 40% of our general budget is spent on policing. We also are one of the top five cities to pay out to families who police have murdered. Millions and tens of millions of dollars in my community alone have been paid out to families whose children have been murdered by police in wrongful death suits. And yet we have no money for masks for people in the midst of a global pandemic. We have no money to expand our public health departments in the midst of a global pandemic. We have no money to actually meet people's needs. And so as long as we continue to bloat police budgets, to allow police lobbies to continue to be powerful at the expense of all of us, then we won't actually get the things that we need to live well. It's just basic math. Uh, a couple more things and then I'll wrap. Um, so as Katrina G uh, Gamble would say, and I want to give her credit for this because when she said it on Twitter, I said, yes, I'm going to use this everywhere, but I also believe in crediting people when they say good things. We cannot message test our way to freedom. <laughs> I'm so glad we did not change Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter and, you know, Green Lives Matter and all the things. And in that same way, I want to say very clearly that we need to be able to focus here on continuing to pull open the crack in this nation that could allow us to move towards a better future and a better present for all of us. So I'll leave that piece there. Um, lastly, I wanna say, uh, while we are seeing this um, explosion of visionary and pop visionary demands that are now becoming popularized, um, I do wanna be very clear that there is a huge gap between the conversations that are happening in Congress right now and the conversations and the demands that are coming from this uprising. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity last week to testify in a, in, a, in a hearing that the Congressional Black Caucus pulled together on policing and the Justice and Policing Act. And I want to be very, very clear. We have a long way to go as it comes to the people who we actually forced right, in this moment to um, come out of uh, Rona quarantine and actually govern, right? So that's a win. That is a huge win, right? Folk had to come back from their places in the Hamptons. They had to come back from their districts, and they actually had to come together and put something on paper to say, we have to address this. That is a huge victory, and we should be celebrating and supporting that. And at the same time, I want to say that while um, – this message and this demand is becoming very popular, we should be clear that um, people in Congress are afraid. They're afraid that they are going to lose their jobs if they align themselves with um, this movement, but they also know that they have to do something because if they don't, then we are going to have a very long, hot summer. Um, and, you know, we are kind of getting a little bit closer to things like oversight, things like transparency, maybe a little tiny bit closer to things like accountability, but again, millions of dollars going to the Department of Justice to monitor and oversee, but the Department of Justice is monitored and overseen by somebody who is a zealot, right, and does not have it in their mind or in their heart or in their values or in their priorities to hold anybody accountable, except for the people who are in the streets. So <laughs> we have to do our work to close the gap between the conversations that are happening in Congress and the conversations that are happening in our communities. And actually this audience is very important in that endeavor. Um, last thing I'll say, and then I, I wanna talk with you, Ellie, cause we, you know, I try to open up some things so we could talk about a lot of things. <laughs> but last thing I will say here is this. You know, there is, this is a, a weird moment for me. I'll be super honest. Um, I believe in cycles and I believe in, um, that I believe that every knot, no matter how tight, will eventually become loose enough to be untied. 
And so here we are in this moment and this thing that we help to birth. Um, and I'm just sitting with the fact that four weeks ago, you know, the work that I do, I, I run an organization called the Black Futures Lab. We work to make black communities powerful in politics. We also have a, a sister organization called the Black to the Future Action Fund, which works to elect uh, progressive black rule makers, right, with a vision for how to make black communities powerful in politics. We released a black agenda, which is a series of immediate tasks that uh, legislators and rule makers can do right now to start to make black communities powerful in every aspect of our lives. And four weeks ago, I want to tell you, I was, you know, knocking on the door of the Joe Biden campaign and saying, hey, what y'all are doing right now is not going to cut it. <laughs> you are not talking to black communities about the things that we care about. And the way that I know that is because my organization conducted the largest survey of black people in America in 155 years. And I'm pretty clear what black communities are saying that we are experiencing every day and what we want to see for our futures. And that is this black agenda. And I can tell you that the response that we were hearing four weeks ago was, we got this. We don't need that. We got black folks in the bag, right? And then we were hearing all of this news about potentially considering people like Amy Klobuchar as a vice presidential pick. Well, Amy Klobuchar, as you all know, um, it, you know, she is essentially out of that consideration now, given what's happened um, in her state under her watch and given the decisions and choices that she made in relationship to not just black communities, but in relationship to police and policing in her own state. I will also say, though, that um, four weeks ago, um, I was trying to raise money for my work and my organization and being told, well, we're a little bit nervous, um, we're a little bit scared about this, um, you know, we're, we're, we're shifting our funding to, you know, make sure that we can keep museums open during the pandemic. Um, there's no money for black organizing. And frankly, we're not really sure that we um, believe that organizing is effective or impactful. And then literally the very next week, this country erupts and my phone is ringing off the hook from those same entities. What can we do? How can we be here? We wanna make a statement. How can we give money? Where do we give money? And I have to just be honest, it's exhausting. And the reason that it's exhausting is because um, if we really want Black communities to be powerful, if we really want all lives to matter, then we have to be invested in that all the time. <laughs> we have to invest in all lives mattering all the time, not just all lives mattering when there's crisis that is shameful and embarrassing to the stated purpose and vision and values of this country. We cannot go every seven years and say, oh, now we're going to invest in black communities. And then, you know, because people are now in the streets, we're going to pull back and say, whatever happened to that Black Lives Matter thing? So I can tell you, nobody went away, as you can see. And um, we have all continued to do the work that we committed to doing in 2013 and in 2014. But the only people that went away, right, were the people that we think weren't actually deeply invested in it in the first place. Black Lives Matter. Black power, Black political power, Black freedom cannot be a brand that people associate themselves with when it's convenient. In this period, I have said no to almost every request that I have gotten to do diversity and inclusion trainings at somebody's lunchtime speaker series. I don't do that work. Diversity and inclusion is not the work that I do. The work that I do is working to make Black communities powerful in our own lives. And there are lots of people that do diversity and inclusion work. That's not to shade that work. It's to say, that's not the work of this moment. <laughs> that's not the work of this moment. And frankly, I'll just close on this. Um, the defunding of black infrastructure, the defunding of black uh, um, institutions has led to, and it helps to maintain 
a lack of black political power. Every single person on this call will say to me, and I bet you we hear it in the comments when we open it up for questions, well, what are we gonna do to translate this moment from protest into political power? And I'm going to say back to you, what are you doing and what have you done to invest in black infrastructure so that black communities can be powerful in this moment? And what will be your 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 year commitment to that? Because these moments, because of the ways that our economy is set up, because of the ways our democracy is set up, we are prone towards crisis. Crisis is inevitable given the way that this country is organized. But what doesn't have to be inevitable is that we are not prepared to meet the moment and we have to stop saying to black folks, well, why haven't you guys translated this into political power when four weeks ago, literally four weeks ago, in the midst of one of the most important election years in my generation, four years ago, I had to, or four weeks ago, I was begging for resources to talk to black voters, to register black voters, to help educate black voters, to help activate black voters. Four weeks ago, and actually still today, I am still waiting on my phone call from the Joe Biden campaign. Hey, seems like we should be talking about that black agenda now. <laughs> and, and so in November, um, if the Democratic candidate doesn't prevail, are we going to turn to Black Lives Matter? Or are we going to turn and look at ourselves and say, damn, did we not meet that moment the way that we should have? The consequence of not meeting that moment, unfortunately, is different than it was in 2016. Because this time around, if we don't meet this moment, it is quite, quite possible that this president not only gets reelected, but decides to stay in power, whether he gets reelected or not. That's what we're facing. <laughs> so I just want to like drop that here. And with that, I will, um, I will close up so that we can chitty chat. That's a great opening, Alicia. Thank you so much. Look, I, I hear the frustration in your voice and I, and I hope everybody hears it too. There, there's, a, there's an aspect here um, of, I think for African-Americans um, who have been fighting this fight, um, that, that's nightmarish deja vu. You know, I've talked about how there's, there's nothing that I've written about George Floyd that I did not write about Eric Gardner. There's nothing that I've written about these protests that I did not write about Ferguson. I'm just changing the names of the victims and the dates. And I, and I hope people understand how annoying that is <laughs> at a very deep level, because we have been here before. Mm -hmm. But so, so I, mm -hmm. I just, I just want to highlight that and hope people get that. Um, you brought up the name, and and I'm I'm gonna start there just because you know, as a black person in this country, I feel like every black person has been drafted into the defense of this name. Um, it's, it is the question that that it, you know, it doesn't take two shots of tequila to get a white person to ask me, but why not Black Wise Matters too? Like that is that is a thing. <laughs> um, so with, with that said, one of the ways that I, I handled that, that my, in my defense of the name, um, I talked to a lot of uh, kind of civil libertarians and, you know, the Cato Institute type people who are all like, mm -hmm. we would be totally with you on this issue of excessive police power. Um, but the name is so jar. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. So you're saying you agree that black people shouldn't be shot, but you don't want to come out more because you don't like the name? I mean, look, I don't like the name Bon Jovi, but when it shows up on the jukebox, I'm singing, right? Because that's just what it's called. So I don't, how, how do you deal with, I'm serious, how do you deal with people who honestly support everything about the cause but the name? Like, how do you, how do you, how do you assuage their uncomfortableness um, with the with the stridentness of the name, um, despite what they would argue is is uh, you know felicity to the cause. Honestly, I don't. Um, what I know is I'm even being made uncomfortable in this moment, and I've been doing this work for a very long time. On the, on the farthest left side of the spectrum, <laughs> and you know. The notion, right, that we can unabashedly say things that we said to each other <laughs> out in public um, is actually important. I think it's an, I don't want to, 
I don't want to take away the level of discomfort that people are feeling because frankly, I think that discomfort is where the magic happens. There is discomfort that's happening right now that um, is changing the conversation. I can't, you have to imagine what this is like for me. I try to turn on the TV after a very long day. I collapse on my couch and I just want something mindless. And so I think to myself, self, you can turn on the television and find something mindless. And I can't. I turn on the television and there's, you know, a whole banner that says, learn more about black lives. And then you can pick any documentary or TV show that you ever wanted to watch about black people and the black liberation struggle. Um, you know, I go to try to watch my Housewives franchise, which I find, you know, just helps me clear, clear the mind. But they're talking about it, right? I mean, watch what happens live with Andy Cohen is talking about systemic racism. There is not a place that I get to go, right, where I can tune out. And that's me. I think that's a beautiful thing. I want this to continue. And so I, you know, when people say things like, well, I'm with all of this, but I'm just not with how you're talking about it. I mean, I have to be honest and say, well, then you should grapple with that. Because frankly, I don't care if you call it rainbows and unicorns and puppies, but the, 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 the end goal has to be the same. And let's grapple with what makes us uncomfortable about this. People um, didn't call uh, the Republican Party when they were attempting to defund Planned Parenthood and say, I'm really uncomfortable with this message. Everybody knew what it meant. <laughs> Everybody was really clear about what it meant. No one was confused. Nobody said, hey, guys, I'm really, I'm very supportive of what you're trying to do, but I just can't deal with how you're talking about it. No. <laughs> we, have to, we, we either have to say what we mean or not say it at all. And I think that what we mean is not let's make police nicer or train them more or you know, give them, you know, surveil them more. Like, that's not what people are saying. People are saying we actually need to invest in, in, in things that keep us safe. And we don't believe that that is policing. And there isn't any data to tell us that policing is keeping us more safe <laughs> than, than we would be if our communities have the things we needed to live well. And if there weren't people who were solving problems in our communities with guns and badges and qualified immunity. Right? Last question. So it's just kind of like a basic thing there. Last question for me before I open it up to, uh, 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 to the people. Um, you, I want to end my questioning a little, with a little bit of hope. You've written recently um, about how the international aspect of these protests have given you a little bit of hope. I, to me, it's one of the reasons why Black Lives is the right name for this. Um, there are Black Lives all over this globe um, that have suffered under the yoke of, of white oppression. Um, um, and we're seeing, especially in Europe, you know, Black people in Europe got their own problems. Like they got their own, you know, they have their own battles to fight. But we see now um, in this moment, um, people across the world, people of color across the world kind of rising up not only to show solidarity with us, but to, uh, to uh, deal with some of the structures of oppression um, in their own countries. You says that this gives you hope. You know, can you expand on that a little bit? Like, why is this? Why is this something that we haven't seen before? Well, I mean, the reason that it gives me hope is that, frankly, we need help in ridding our country of um, of what we're dealing with right now. And having what is happening here be projected onto a global stage is important. Um, as somebody who has built relationships with folks internationally, I can tell you there's also a lot of misconceptions um, both ways about how our governments work and how our societies function. And, you know, I can remember the first time I spent on the continent, <clears throat> I was in Nairobi, Kenya, and having a conversation with somebody who a, a, a black brother who said, um, I hear that black people in your country get free money. <laughs> and I, I like, it took me so long to figure out what is he talking about until I realized he was talking about welfare, right? And so then I had to actually break it down and be like, that's not actually, 
<laughs> first of all, it's not free. <laughs> it's not <laughs> at all, right? Actually, Black people are not the main recipients of that. And, you know, so anyways, the point here is I think that there's two things that become important about the global nature of this movement. I mean, one, it is fundamentally, uh, it's a Black Lives Matter movement, but it is also fundamentally um, anti-right wing. Um, and so when we are talking about, you know, the, the demands of this movement, we shouldn't forget that one of the demands of this movement is for Trump to resign. Um, and I think that, you know, we actually started to see a lot more international participation um, with that demand, um, because I think that across the globe, uh, there is, if, if we don't unify on anything else, there is unity, that this leadership is not good for us and it's not good for the rest of the world. And then finally, I will say that um, it's an opportunity for us, you know, to expand our awareness and our understanding of how much of a global community we actually are. Um, the way that our economy is structured, we um, allow ourselves a level of isolationism um, because we, we actually prey on other countries and their economies. <laughs> and so um, this is a moment, I think, you know, given the pandemic, I feel like the curtains got pulled back and people started to realize, oh, shoot, we actually really need each other to survive. We really need each other to survive. And now that all of these other things are out of the way or not functioning anymore, now we see how dependent we are on each other and we have to strengthen our bonds. And I'm hoping that that gets extended to better understanding um, how dependent we are on each other as a global community and making new choices about our level of dependence. Are we interdependent and cooperative or are we parasitic right and that's that's an option that's in front of us and we get to um point point the vehicle in the right direction in november um that's that's one of our first shots but then there will be many many more after that um talking about how the movement is all the global movement is also an anti-right wing movement Leads us very good well into uh, the first question I want to ask from the audience. This is from Michael. Um, is this a time to elevate the demand for Medicare for all as a way to, God, I love the nation. That's such a, <laughs> um, as a way to guarantee health care for, um, for all and fund public health to overcome race-based disparities um, and, to the, and social detriment, detriment of health. This is, you know, is this the moment, especially as you know, we live with this COVID stuff still hanging over all of this, um, is this the moment that we make Medicare for all and link that up to the struggle for social justice and racial justice and human rights? I think that it's a very important moment to start to um, help people crystallize what these resources could be going to instead and how it would improve people's lives. So sure, Medicare for all, I think is very important. Um, housing for all, very important. Education and jobs for all, very important. Especially as we move into what we can only um, predict will be a period of austerity and, and pretty severe austerity. It is important to start to make demands for the public safety net now. Um, but I wanna implore us to not lose the peace, right, around um, the racialized nature of policing in this country and what that does, right, to our public infrastructure. So yes and, um, yeah, yes and. Um, softball question here um, from Alexandra. What if BLM protesters that carry the same kind of weapons um, that the protesters who want to liberate Michigan openly uh, carry? What do, you, what, do you, what do you think would have happened <laughs> to, 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 to the movement if we were as armed as the, the, the all haircuts matter people? No, there would not be a movement, <laughs> if that was true. I mean, if history tells us anything, and frankly, you know, if the president tells us anything, what, I'm, what I know is that across the country, you know, people who are participating in protests are being visited by the FBI. Um, what I know is that um, there is a, uh, uh, a rise and a resurgence of white nationalist forces and white supremacist forces. Um, and they are 
using, right, tried to use um, this uprising to create chaos and, um, and pain. And so, and nothing is being done about that, right? We are focused 100% on an ideology that is being called an organization, <laughs> but we are not being focused, right, on an organization with a deadly ideology. And that is a very, very big problem. So, um, you know, the contrast that you offer here is very clear, but, you know, black people cannot be walking around with guns right now in the same ways that white militias are being encouraged to walk around with guns right now in the name of law and order. Um, I want to ask, uh, we talked about this in, in, in your open, um, and I think it's such an important aspect um, to your work. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, the unique challenges for people of color who are gay, lesbian, um, trans? Um, th this, is, this is a moment for them as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> if you, for, for listeners who don't know, on Monday, the Supreme Court um, made a major, major gay rights decision um, in a case called Bostock, uh, basically affirming that um, gay, lesbian, transgender people were protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's a huge victory for gay rights. It is inarguably the biggest victory for trans rights ever uh, from a legal perspective. That's right. uh, um, That's right. uh, and, and when we talk about this moment in terms of protesting for black lives, um, I'm always reminded that the most successful civil rights movement of my lifetime um, has been the gay rights movement. That, that, that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm in my early 40s. Like, that's the one that's worked so far. So both kind of what lessons can, can uh, uh, the, the racial justice movement learn from the gay rights movement? And how do, how do we think about advocating for black lives, um, especially in a world where, again, as you put it in your opening, we, we focus so much on black men as opposed to the, the, the physical destruction of black women, of gay, lesbian, trans black people. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? I sure can. So. You know, let me start off by saying gay for the gays, and I include myself in that. <laughs> I'm like, way to have a gay agenda. I love that. <laughs> Point one, one, we love that. Okay, so, but in all seriousness, um, there is no gay agenda, but I wish there was. <laughs> and also, um, maybe we'll work on that next, who knows. Um, what is what happened this week at the Supreme Court is incredibly important for two reasons. I mean, one, you just named that it's one of the, it's the most, I agree with you, the most significant legal victory for protections for trans communities um, ever in the history of this country. But also, um, it is a clear marker that, um, I mean, I was amazed actually that that came from the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> so it's, it's actually also really important to understand and to keep fighting for being able to hold and shift that body in such a way that it continues to uphold the rights of all people. We should understand that the revolution that is sweeping this country is intent on changing that very body to not make decisions like the one they made. Um, and we can keep saying, you know, let's wrap RBG and bubble wrap, but you know what? That woman has done her work. <laughs> and she, you know what I mean? She has done her work, um, but we need to also fight for the Supreme Court. So um, for those of us who, you know, um, want to see a better world that has to be a part of our our, our vision but the, the other thing i want to just mention about this is that this is what becomes so dangerous about black lives matter being seen only as a a movement to fight police violence and policing in our communities because from the very beginning right we have talked about the fact that violence exists in many forms in our communities um, and that we have to address the the layers of who black communities are in this country. And we have pushed very, very hard to make sure that when we're talking about black lives, we're talking about trans black people, we're talking about gay and lesbian and bisexual and pansexual black people, that we are talking about black immigrants, that we are talking about 
black poor people, black people who are incarcerated, like that there's a breadth and a depth to who our communities are. And frankly, um, that, you know, when it comes to trans communities, it's not, the dynamic is not so much that um, trans folks are being killed by police, like trans folks are being killed by other members in our communities um, who do not see trans people as people or as human. And so when you look at, you know, if we want to talk about wage gaps, you know, um, <laughs> you can only imagine what trans folks um, are experiencing in the workplace. Um, the gap between what trans folks should be making to be able to live and what people are making now if they're able to be in the formal economy um, is very, very wide. And so this decision actually makes it law that trans communities um, alongside other communities that our lives have to be valued right in our workplaces in our homes in our places of worship all of that this is a game changer because um you know it, i think it allows frankly i mean without getting into all these minute details i think it allows us to look at trans people in life and not just in death and it allows us to reimagine, right? What do safe and healthy workplaces look like for all of us? Um, and it allows us to also kind of enter into this conversation, not from a place of tragedy, but from a place of what other rules can we change to make sure that we're safe everywhere that we are? Um, so that feels important to me about this decision alongside other things. Um, last thing I'll say on this is that I, you know, I have, friends who have been hanging on for dear life, um, who work in the DOJ. They're just trying to sit out this administration, <laughs> basically. They're just trying to sit the thing out. And, you know, two days before this decision came out from the Supreme Court, um, one of the final rules that had been written under the, you know, Office of Civil Rights um, had been rescinded that was protecting uh, the right of trans folks to be able to access medical care, right? The Supreme Court decision, of course, uh, makes that null, right? It like essentially overrides that, but still, <laughs> like that's where we were on Friday. <laughs> and on Monday, we got to a different place. This is why I'm saying I've lived 30 years in the last three weeks. Yeah, this change is happening like at an incredible pace. Mm -hmm. It's not like these Republicans are going to take that decision lying down. Like the 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 oh the no, empire, they're going to the empire will strike back. Like the oh, it's they're already striking. Right. All right, uh, Alicia, I want to get you out of here on this. Uh, Pat asks, how do we get the Biden campaign to actually understand the concerns of the Black community and not just give it lip service? Um, how do you get the message across um, that just being anti-Trump is not enough? Pat, that was such a nice way of putting it. I would have used curse words. Um, Alicia, <laughs> wh what do we do about Biden? What do we do about this VP pick? Like, what's how do we make this message get to that man? Well, they need to hear from you. Um, and I will say that part of what I think they're banking on right now is that they feel that they have Black voters in the bag because Black voters, um, you know, essentially decisively stood behind um, Biden in the primaries. Um, there's a lot to talk about inside of that. So I don't want you to walk away with this notion that all black people are behind Biden. That's just not true. I think there's pragmatic decisions that folk made um, in particular states. And we should remember primaries are still happening. <laughs> um, but it's also but just it's that, insulting to me, right? Because it's almost like, you know, it's like oh, yeah. your wife like marries you and they're like, oh, she married me. I don't gotta worry about her no more. <laughs> like what? what? Like, <laughs> first person you worry about. So, sorry. I, there's so much wrong with it. But I will also say that, you know, that's, that's part of politics because we're, we are, we're seen as an appendage um, that will always be around. And so I'm working on that <laughs> because I think we actually deserve and we should be focused on making the candidate better. Um, so there's that. So we're working on that, but you need to work on it too. So they are betting on the fact that um, they actually feel like they need white voters. They are trying to um, convert 
people who voted for Trump in 2016 um, and, you know, people who voted for Obama in 2012 and then voted for Trump in 2016, they're still banking on this notion that they can change the minds of those white folks and get them back over to the Democratic Party. I think that that is a false assumption. I don't think we have the, the data to support that, but that is the strategy that I believe that they're pursuing. So they need to hear from white voters. They need to hear from white voters on the Democratic side, um, in particular, that um, what they're doing is not sufficient. They are definitely hearing from black folks that what they're doing is not sufficient, but they need to hear from white folks that what they're doing is not sufficient. And frankly, I mean, I hate to say this, but when that happens, it's really the time when, when our phones start to ring and they say, okay, well, let's have this conversation. So you can also just call them up, send them emails. You know, they're sending you fundraising emails. You can reply and say, um, well, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about what are you doing about a black agenda? I'm concerned about, you know, what is your, what is your thinking around um, who your running mate will be and how you will use that strategically to not only win this election, but win back the country. Um, and I'm concerned about making sure that you don't waffle on this commitment that you've made to um, put a black woman on the Supreme Court. What will the values of that black woman be? If yep. white people ever wanted to speak to the manager, please speak to the manager of the Democratic <laughs> nominee. Please. Alicia, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for your time with us today. Um, stay safe. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming in. Again, thank you for supporting independent journalism. Stay safe. Uh, join us next Wednesday. We'll have Pulitzer Prize winning author Eric Foner. Uh, Foner's written an, an amazing book about Reconstruction and the Reconstruction Amendments that was so good that I took my book proposal and threw it out the window because he, he did it all. Um, so join us next week for that. We also have uh, coming up in, over the summer, Ro Khanna and Naomi Klein will be joining us on these chats. Thank you so much for coming. Everybody stay safe. Peace. Thank you.